Hello, I shall start on Fermi direct distribution using electrons as an example. I'm going to derive the distribution of um, the energies of electrons. So we'll think about um, the electrons in a, in a box in the same way as we thought about um, the ideal gas in the, an earlier lecture. So we have a box and there are these electrons moving, moving around in the box and these particles of electrons do not interact with each other. So that's the, the simple assumption that uh, we start with. So this means that we will have the same, uh, we can take over a lot of the same results from ideal gas. We, can, we will have the same quantization condition, uh, the same from the same wave functions. So this means that we can use the same formula for the density of states for the ideal gas. Now, the difference would be in the, the number of particles for each state. All right. And as with the ideal gas, we shall use as, a, as the final goal of this exercise, we shall take the final goal as the heat capacity. So what we are going to do is we are going to aim to calculate the heat capacity of the electrons in the metal. And in order to do that, as before, we need to first find the total energy. And to find the total energy, we need to know the energies of each state and we need to know the number of particles in each state. So since we are taking over the ideal gas model, we already know uh, the energies for each state and we also have the density of states formula. So what remains now is to find the number of particles in each state. And to do that, we need to make use of the same method based on the Lagrange multiplier. To, uh, uh, to use that to maximize the number of arrangements of, of the electrons among the energy levels. But then, if there's so much similarity, what is the difference with electrons? There are two differences. Now, if you recall, for the ideal gas, in order to derive the number of particles in each state, we have made use of a feature of uh, ideal gas, which is that for typical um, for typical temperatures of real gases that we that we are familiar with, the number of states is a lot bigger than the number of ideal gas atoms. So when we, we used that feature as an assumption when we, when we derived the number of particles for each state using the Lagrange multiplier method. Now, in the case of the electron, as it turns out, we can no longer use this assumption. Right now, this this we shall justify later on, um, or we shall show later on when we have derived an expression for the distribution of the electrons. But for now, we are simply lifting this assumption, so we are removing an assumption. So so it is fine if we just go ahead with fewer assumptions to to try and derive the results. Now as to the part about uh, the fact that electrons obey, uh, the, the next difference is that electrons obey the Pauli exclusion principle. 
So we'll see how that comes in afterwards. So let's start with the same um, picture as we had for when we derived number of, number of particles per state for the ideal gas. I would draw these lines here to represent the energy levels. So there will be particles distributed among the energy levels. Okay. Now, I would now divide these energy levels into intervals. Let me call that the i-th interval. So below that, I would have the i minus 1 interval. Above that, I would have the i plus 1 interval, and so on. And suppose that this interval has, um, has a width of dE. All right. And that, in this interval, I have Ni, partic Ni electrons, or particles, and Gi states. It's the same picture that we have used for ideal gas. So the next thing then is, in order to use the Lagrange multiplier method, um, we must first find the number of arrangements and then we add in the constraints that the total number of particles must be fixed and that the total energy must be fixed. So let's start with the number of arrangements. Now we'll start with the number of arrangements of the electrons within that interval dE. I shall call this number of arrangement omega i. Right. So here is the part where the Pauli exclusion principle comes in when we start thinking about the arrangement. Well, according to the exclusion principle, no two electrons can occupy the same state. But that is obviously going to make a difference to the number of arrangements. If more electrons can occupy the same state, then clearly we are going to have a lot more arrangements. So given this rule, um, we have to think about how then we can, we can find a formula for the number of arrangements given this restriction. Now if you look at this picture, you see that we have lines represent, rep representing the energy states. I'm going to think of the lines as representing the states and we have these circles here representing the electrons. Now in order to include this feature that each state can have at most one electron, all right, or it can have no electron, in order to include this feature in, in, in finding the number of arrangements, there's a simple way to do that. The way is, if you look at this line here, for example, that contains an electron. So this line here is right next to the ball. The way to do it is to imagine that the ball is stuck to the line. And think of the ball and line combination as a single object. All right? And those lines without the ball, to think of it as a different object. So what we have is a situation in which we have two types of objects in this interval. We have lines, that's one type of object, and we have ball stuck to the line, that's the other type of object. So we have two different objects. And now we have a case where there are two different types of objects and we want to find the number of arrangements. So once we put it in these terms, it becomes possible to actually derive the answer. Now what we need to do know is the number of each type of object. The number of um, states is gi. 
All right, number of particles is a line. So since the particles are always stuck to a line, therefore there must be n i of this um, ball stuck to line object. Okay. Now the rest are just lines. Now, since the lines are, are the states, except for those that are stuck to the particle, therefore, those that are just lines will be the number of states minus the number of particles. So now we have the number. All right, we have this number of one type of object and we have that number of the other type of object. Now, and, the, and the total number of objects here would be the sum of the two, which is just gi. So the total number of objects is gi, and if they're all different, if the objects are all different, then gi factorial is the number of arrangement. But because n i of them are identical, the ball line uh, object, we have to divide by n i factorial, and gi minus n i of them are identical. Those are the just line object. So if you divide by gi minus ni factorial, right? So now we have the expression for the number of arrangements of electrons among the states in the ith energy interval. And in order to um, find the total number of arrangements for all electrons in all intervals, we simply need to multiply the number of arrangements for, for every interval together. Meaning, um, the overall omega would be omega 1 number of arrangements in the first interval times omega 2 in the second interval dot 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 for all intervals. So that would be the total number number of arrangements. So while we are here, if you recall that um, what we have done with the Boltzmann distribution and ideal gas when we apply the Grange multiplier method, <coughs> we need to take the log of the um, number of arrangements to make use of Stirling's approximation because when we take the log the approximate formula does not have a factorial and that makes it easier when we differentiate and maximize the function. So we'll do that here um, and see what the expression looks like. Log omega would be, since log is a product of this log 1, log 2, and so on. When you take the log of that, it becomes the sum of the log. So it is log 1 omega 1 plus log... Sorry, log omega 1 plus log omega 2 plus dot 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 log omega i. What it looks like and eventually somewhere along the uh, line uh, the Lagrange multiplier method we remember that we have to differentiate this expression so I'll do that here since we have all the formulas we have to do log um, differentiate log omega by and I all right, because we want to find the set of ni that gives the maximum uh, number of arrangements. Now, when we differentiate with respect to ni, notice that the omega i is a function of ni. So, omega 1 is a function of n1, omega 2 is a function of n2. So, which, which means that if I'm differentiating with respect to a particular ni, all of these terms would be independent of 
ni except for omega i, which means that all of these will become zero except for one of them. So this becomes equal to d of log ni alone. So this is this this simplifies things. So which means that all I need is to differentiate a single expression of that. So let's do that now. And in order to differentiate that, um, we make use of Stirling's approximation. Oh, um, take that away. Stirling's approximation looks like this. is equal to n log n minus n. Alright? That's the next approximation. So if I apply this to here, I get log omega i. Let's write this out. Log gi factorial minus log ni factorial minus log gi minus ni factorial and applying Stirling's approximation we get gi log gi minus gi minus ni log ni minus ni minus gi minus ni log with a big bracket around that gi minus ni minus gi minus ni that's what it looks like now, you're ready to differentiate d log omega i by d and i. Okay, so gi is the number of states that is constant with respect to ni. So this differentiates to zero. So next we differentiate this. This is hopefully by now familiar. So if you differentiate this, we'll just get log ni for the whole log. Finally, the square bracket. Right. So when we differentiate this with respect to ni, let's start with the first factor. With a minus ni there, that differentiates to minus 1. So I'll get minus log gi minus ni. Alright. Now in the next term, I will differentiate block of that. And because there's a minus sign there, I'll end up with minus of 1 over this. Okay. Minus of 1 over this times this gives is minus 1. Right, and then when we differentiate the ni there, we get 1. With the two minus signs there, I'll get a plus 1. So minus 1 plus 1 is 0, and I'm left with just this plus this. So that's the expression that we have. So I'm just I'll write this out, log n, n i, plus 
log g i minus n i. That's the expression here. So we are, we are going to make use of this in a moment when we do the Lagrange function. Now let's write down the Lagrange function and differentiate it. Lagrange function is the sum of log omega, which we want to maximize. It, ha it also contains the constraints, number of particles and total energy, which should be constants. And we need to put in the unknown factors, which we call the multipliers, the Lagrange multipliers. And then we need to add this all up. Right? Now we can differentiate this. dL by d and i. We've already found the answer for the derivative of log omega, which we saw just a moment ago. That's minus log of ni plus log of gi minus ni. So that's log omega. n here is equal to n1 plus n2 and so on. So if we differentiate with respect to a particular ni, we just get 1 for the n. So that gives plus lambda 1 times 1. Now u, u is equal to ni times ei plus u is equal to n1 e1 plus n2 e2 and so on. So if we differentiate with respect to a particular ni again, we'll just get ei for the term that contains ni, ei. All the other terms would differentiate to zero because, because the n's are different. So differentiating u gives ei and lambda 2 is multiplied by that. So that's what we get when we differentiate the Lagrange function. And to maximize that, we would set this to zero. And we are almost there now. The next step is to solve for the ni, which is what we are after. All right, so let's write this out. Just by rearranging this, bringing minus log ni to the other side, I get log and i is equal to this lot. All right. Now to solve for log, to solve for n i, let's raise this to the power of an exponential. So I'll invert log n i and this becomes g i minus n i e to the power of lambda 1, e to the power of lambda 2, e i. So once we have this, it should be fairly straightforward to solve for um, and I. Okay. Now before, before that, let's have a look at the lambda 1 and lambda 2 here. Now we have already seen in the derivation for the Boltzmann distribution 
we have already know how to treat lambda 1 and lambda 2. And we know that lambda 2 by using the Boltzmann postulate and thermodynamics that this is minus 1 over K Bt. Now in the Boltzmann distribution, we, um, we renamed e to the power of lambda 1 as a. So we call that a. Now by this time, we, are not going to, we, are, we shall not do that. We shall do it a bit differently, as we'll see in a moment. Right. So, and, um, and the other thing is, for now, let me, let me combine this product and, and put the two powers together. Okay, let me write it in this form for now. Right, so now let's solve for the Ni. I'll bring this Ni over to the left. Get Ni plus um, let me write it this way. I'll get Ni E to the power of lambda 1 plus lambda 2 Ei. This comes over to the left plus the Ni there is equal to this way. Right, let me first divide both sides by the exponential. n i e to the power minus lambda 1 minus lambda 2 e i is equal to g i minus n i. Let's do this. And then move the n i over to the other side. Yeah. And I e to the minus lambda one minus lambda two e i plus and i is equal to g i. Right. Let me clean this away. So then, inverting the expression to get Ni, we have Gi, I'll write it in this form, Gi times 1 over e to the power of minus lambda 1 minus lambda 2 Ei plus 1. So now we have an expression for Ni. So let's now come back to look at lambda 1 and lambda 2. So we, we know what lambda 2 is. Now, lambda 1 there lambda 1 there is Conventionally written in this form, mu over k b t. Now mu is simply another unknown constant. So what this means is that conventionally, this unknown constant lambda one is simply re-expressed in terms of another unknown constant mu which is called the chemical potential. So I shan't go into why it's called the chemical potential. We're just going to treat this as a, a, a constant that we'll have to work with and, and we'll learn a bit more about this constant afterwards. So 
with lambda 1 is equal to that and lambda 2 equal to minus 1 over k b t when we put this into that we will finally get the familiar expression The familiar expression here, which we know as the Fermi Dirac distribution. Okay, so that's where we are. Now to put this in a more convenient form, we would divide both sides of this expression by the energy interval. Now we have already seen this when we talked about ideal gas. Since gi is the number of states in the energy interval, when you divide the number of states by the energy interval, we get the density of states. And ni, the number of particles in the interval divided by the interval, gives us the number density. And this expression here, right, is often represented by the symbol F. So F epsilon. And we understand this expression, this function or, or this full expression, we would understand it as the number of particles in one state. Now in this case a, a more um, a better description uh, instead of calling it the number of particles in one state at this energy is probably to call it the average number of particles in one state. The reason is as we shall see in a moment um, this expression here is actually is typically smaller than 1. So this expression here is typically a fraction. All right. So we wouldn't have a fraction of an electron, but we could have, uh, but that could mean an average number. Right. Okay, so the next thing that we'll do is to look at this expression um, a bit more to see how it looks like in a graph and to understand a bit more about how it changes with temperature. So just one more thing to, to mention. Notice that I've dropped the index i. So ei now, I've now written it as e. The reason is because I've used I to, to refer to the discrete intervals of, of energy in the picture just now. But now we have expressed it in this form where it is more convenient to think about E as a continuous variable. So in, instead of referring to the energy with the index I, we can just as well refer to the energy by its actual value. All right, so the value of the E would represent uh, the energy itself. So now let's have a look at what the graph would look like. I have Fe equals to 1 over Exp bracket bracket E minus mu over Kbt Plus one. Now to start with, we consider what happens when t goes to zero. So if t goes to zero, since t is the, in the denominator of this argument, 
the whole argument goes to infinity. So therefore, um, right, the whole argument goes to infinity. So what happens to the exponential then will depend on whether the argument is positive or negative. So let me get ready the axis for a graph. That's uh, FE. Now the mu there is an unknown constant, but let's say mu is somewhere there on the energy axis. So E minus mu can be plus or minus depending on whether the E is on this side or on that side. So suppose we, let's start from the left side. Suppose that the E there, E is on to the left of the mu. So E minus mu would be negative. So this means that I have a negative argument and if T goes to zero, the argument goes to minus infinity and the exponential goes to zero. So I'm left with one over one, which is one. So which means that as long as E is below mu, the graph would be a constant at one. Now to the right of mu, E minus mu is positive. So a positive number over T, which goes to zero, becomes infinite. So therefore, I have an infinity plus one in the denominator. And one over infinity is zero. So therefore, if E is to the right uh, of mu, the function would come down to zero. And that's what it looks like when T goes to zero. Now, and if you think about it, what it means physically is that for energies of electrons which are below a certain value, the average number of electrons in a state at this energy is 1. And that means that the state is fully occupied. That, that means that there is always one electron. There must always be one electron at energies that are below a certain value. But at energies that are above a certain value, there are no electrons. Zero. They are not occupied at all. And physically what this means is this. If you think about this range of energy, there would be a lot of energy states in this range. So a lot of energy levels with a lot of energy states. It just means that electrons below a certain energy... Um, right, let me say that again. It means that energy states below a certain energy, states below a certain energy, are all fully occupied. And states above the energy is not. So let me, let's draw the, the energy levels and think about what this means. It means that if I start from the bottom of the levels, the electrons would occupy every state below a certain energy which is given by the constant mu. And above that, it would not, the states would not be occupied at all. all right? So this means that the electrons are stacked up in the energy level. And this gives a picture which is very different from <clears throat> what we knew about the ideal gas. Now, just to clarify this part, now we, we know that an energy state can be occupied, a, a, a single energy state for an electron can have two spin states. So this means that if I think of this line as energy states, each state can contain up to two electrons. So all the spin, all the states will be filled with two electrons from ground up until a certain maximum energy. So they would be all fully occupied. Of course, um, remember that we are talking about zero Kelvin temperature here. 
and we would expect that if temperature increases, the electrons will start getting excited and go up in the energy levels. Right. And the next thing we want to do then is to find the value of of mu to find this energy which is maximum and there is a name for this energy it is called the Fermi energy and we often describe the, en the, the energy level at this energy as the Fermi level Okay, so let's do that. Um, let's clean this away. Now, in order to find this energy, We will do it in terms of m, the total number of particles. All right. The way to do this is to relate it to the is to count the number of states below that value, which we will now call it e f. So if we if we in order to count the total number of states below a certain energy, if you remember, we can make use of the density of states formula. We can integrate the density of states from 0 to EF. Right? When we integrate the density of states, we are simply adding up all the states up to a certain energy. Now, since when we looked at ideal gas, we have already derived an expression for the density of state for, for the ideal gas, it is convenient to continue using that expression. So for now, let me remind ourselves that if G, that G stands for the, the density of states of the ideal gas, and when we apply this formula to the electrons, we have to remember that each energy state could be occupied by two electrons. Whereas in the case of the ideal gas formula, this ideal gas density of states simply tells us how, tell us how many states there are per unit energy. So in order to count the number of electrons, therefore, we need to multiply the number of states by two. So this expression then gives us the total number of electrons up to the energy EF. And EF is what we want to find. So now let me write down the formula that we know for the density of states. Four m pi v over h cubed. Two m e the r the e. So that's the ideal gas density of states. And 
you see that we have to integrate right all, all the factors are constant apart from e which is raised to the power of half so we have to integrate the square root of e with respect to e so that's a straightforward integral and once we've done that and put in the, the, the symbol for ef into the answer we can then solve for ef so without going through all the steps I'll just write down the final expression for EF. So this is what we get after we have integrated it and did the algebra to solve for EF. That's the final expression. And it is good to note what this Fermi energy depends on. It depends on the mass of, the, of each particle, the number of particles, and the volume. And that it depends, the fact that the, the mass of the particle is in the denominator means that if the mass of the particles is large, then the Fermi energy is small. And also notice that we have n over v here. We have number of particles divided by the volume of the system. So n over v is therefore the, is therefore the number density of the particles, as in the number of particles per unit volume. Now we have to be careful here when we think about the number density. Because earlier on, we have an expression with the symbol NE, if you recall, which I also call the number density. But NE is the number density, is the, as in the number per unit energy. All right? it's, it tells us how to find the number of particles in a certain energy interval. But in this case, N over V is the volume density. It's the number of particles per unit volume. And this is a useful um, idea to remember when we come to actually calculating the Fermi energy from, from data that we might be given. So we'll stop here for this part and carry on in the next session.